quick disclaimer. Everything in this video and all of my videos are my opinion based on detailed research that I perform. That said, I would recommend doing your own research before you make up your mind. Thank you. In May of 1796, George Washington, after serving two terms as the first president of the United States of America, gave his farewell address to the new nation and declined to run for a third term. He did not see his position as president as an appointment for life. And as the first president, Washington knew that he would be setting several precedents for the office. And he was right. The long line of presidents that followed since consistently declined to run for a third term out of respect for Washington. That is until FDR came to town and became president in 1933 and ran for a second term and then a third term and then a fourth term? Clearly, nothing but death could stop FDR from running for office again. After FDR's passing, the precedent was codified into law thanks to the 22nd Amendment. But I find it amazing that over the course of 140 years and 31 different presidents, George Washington served as a symbol of leadership, specifically leadership and power with a willful expiration date as a symbol of contained and responsible power. But his influence since has greatly declined. People don't invoke his messages or the values he personified too much anymore. A few weeks ago with the news of Betty White's passing, some terrible person put out a tweet wondering why it couldn't have been Queen Elizabeth in her place. I won't even show the tweet here since it's such a despicable thing to say and I don't want to give that person any attention. There are enough people inside and outside of the United Kingdom that find the institution of monarchy useless and can't wait until the day it's raised. I've never agreed with that, but I also didn't see the value of a constitutional monarchy until recently. In researching this video, I came across a TED talk explaining why we should choose monarchy. Monarchs are not only capable of coexistence with democracy. In many ways, they enhance democracy. The first way in which this can happen is that a monarch is better suited to be a head of state than any elected official. The reason for this is that a head of state is supposed to represent all of their people, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of religion, and crucially, regardless of political alignment. I'll link the video below and I absolutely recommend watching it in full. But the crux of Noah's point is that monarchy adds stability, consistency, and a nonpartisan challenge to the leaders that get elected by the people. Politicians sway to public opinion. They can be manipulated and are manipulative. They can be bribed, bought, and sold. This is why the people don't have trust in the class of politicians. The offices of the president or prime minister of a nation are designed to be revolving doors, with people coming and going as per the elections. But in the case of the United Kingdom, the Queen is always there. She is a fixture as the head of state and as a representation of the essence of British people's interests, culture, and most importantly, a representation of their values. So what exactly are these values? They're not about absolute power or living excessively like monarchs used to represent in the past. The modern monarchy represents character and morality, like having strength in the face of adversity, being impervious to financial influences like bribery or material gain, and being untouched by any temptation of political power. So completely antithetical to the politicians, the queen is the untouchable embodiment of the ideal governance. She stands above the government. The prime ministers at their appointment are invited to form a government by the queen. But the queen is not above the British people. No, instead, the royal family's primary role is to serve the people. My whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. And it is a practice that is cultivated and passed on within the family, with the working royals serving the people through charity work, sitting down with people that are serving the communities, and bringing attention to important issues facing their society. So let's look at American society, where there is no such ideal representation aside from the founding fathers, but their influence has been on a major decline. The office of the president is no longer looked at with respect, since it is, after all, inhabited by politicians, and there is a decrease of religious influence in our society. So who has replaced that void? Well, celebrities, unfortunately. Celebrities are looked to when it comes to a crisis, for charitable work, 
to speak on important topics like elections, economic troubles, human rights, and more. And while celebrities are more than willing to take this mantle on, they lack the ability to do right by that role. They, after all, have become famous for pretending to be other people or for sex tapes or just plain showing off their wealth. These are hardly the basis for representing an ideal in society. In fact, it is this overemphasis on celebrities that has led to a culture of plastic surgery, virtue signaling, and widespread narcissism. Well, you might ask, do we even need ideal representations to look up to in our society? Yes, yes we do. This is part of our nature. We will always look for ideals to live up to. And generally, these ideal representations display the values of our society back at us. I wonder what would have happened if the values that George Washington embodied could have survived beyond the 140 years they seemed to influence our nation after his death. Values such as service to our country no matter the price, the value of patriotism, the importance of remaining bipartisan and reducing the divide between people, the values of electing people rather than parties to leadership positions. While George Washington represented these values so well, he died long ago and his influence has been written off as irrelevant and too idealistic in our current society. In British society, they have the benefit that the ideal representation of British values is forever embodied by the monarch. And since it's embodied by a person, the representation can grow and change along with the people. Each monarch has the ability to bring with them something to the institution that will ensure its survival. So rather than stay stagnant, irrelevant, and die out, the institution and the representation can evolve and endure. This also puts into context for me why Meghan Markle's and Prince Harry's challenge of the royal family has been such a big deal. People have been obsessed, as am I, with this face-off. There is no shortage of analysis on YouTube of what exactly every move by the family or estranged couple means or could mean for the institution. This face-off is the battle of two opposing views. I've already talked about the values that Her Majesty the Queen represents, but what about Meghan and Harry? Well, Meghan is a celebrity. She is celebrity culture invading the royal family. Instead of strength in the face of adversity, she believes in airing out her problems. She believes in tearful displays of the unfairness of life. And service of others is never done in a sincere fashion, but rather with an ulterior motive. Like when Harry and Meghan went to a school to distribute school supplies, it was purely done as a publicity stunt. After they had the photos, the couple were quick to make themselves scarce. Instead of being unswayed by money, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are all for it, looking for monetization opportunities wherever they can get them, signing deals with Spotify and Netflix, taking camera crews with them when they visit the UN, publishing books using their royal titles. And to cap it off, Prince Harry has plans to publish a book about his family. And finally, the two are tempted by power. It's so clear now that the Oprah interview was a ploy to sow doubt when it came to the suitability of Prince Charles and Prince William as future monarchs. And never should we forget the remark that Meghan made saying that they were one plane crash away from the throne. So the battle between the Sussexes and the royal family isn't simply a family issue or celebrity gossip. It's a public criticism of the values the family represents and a desire to supplant them with celebrity culture. No wonder the British people refuse to take the challenge lying down. And no wonder why the royal family scrutinizes their own public behavior so intensely. This is why all the instances of airing dirty laundry, cheating rumors, or much worse scandals are such a risk to the monarchy. If the monarchy is supposed to represent the ideals of British culture, then it better live up to that ideal. Otherwise, the whole thing may come crumbling down. This is also why people are more and more likely to stand by the Queen instead of siding with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Where the Sussexes offer visions of complaining and narcissism, the Queen offers a higher vision to her people, an ideal to aspire to, to be inspired by. In a world where the difference between right and wrong has become increasingly blurred, despite her family getting embroiled in divorces, feuds, scandals, the Queen has stood as a lone, incorruptible figure. Forgetting Elizabeth Windsor now, now only Elizabeth Regina. Yes? Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. I'm a great admirer of George Washington's and have been mulling over a video talking about the American Revolution versus the French Revolution and why one was successful, why the other was 
complete chaos. I think it has a lot to do with the personalities involved and would be a very interesting study. If you're interested in a video like that, let me know in the comments. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.